Good morning. I'm Mike Barnes, Vines Christian Fellowship. I welcome you this morning to come join us and study the Word of God. Today we're going to be talking about this very day, Palm Sunday. Today it's April 5th, 2020. But we're going to talk about the day back in 32 AD when it was April 6th, 32 AD. And we're going to talk about Palm Sunday and the way we've traditionally known it. And I'm going to tell you some pretty astonishing things about how that day was prophesied 200 years before Christ was born. But first, we want to check on how you're doing during this coronavirus crisis. We want to know how you're doing. Are you doing okay? Do you need anything? God's continuing in business. He doesn't take a vacation. And we're here to help. So if you'd like to talk to someone or need prayer, please contact us through our vineschristianfellowship.com website. Reach out to us and we can help you in any way we can. So I'd like you to know that if you are in Christ, as found in Matthew 28, 20, you're not alone. Christ is with you always. In fact, he says, I never will forget, I never, excuse me, I never will forget you or leave you even until the end of the age. That's a pretty powerful statement. And toward the end of this message, I want to tell you how easy it is to have Christ be part of your life. He's knocking on the door. He's waiting for you to come to him. Palm Sunday. Let's talk a little bit about what we know about Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday obviously has been celebrated for millennia. It was the day that Christ really kind of began his ministry when he came and rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Here he is, all God, all man, riding in on a donkey. But that was just as it was prophesied he would do back hundreds of years before that. He also, as he came back in, he allowed himself to be called Savior and King. And this Palm Sunday was the first day that he allowed that. In fact, many times he would ask the disciples, who do they say I am? And people would say, oh, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're this, you're that. And he would smile. And then Peter, poor Peter, who always gets things wrong, finally got it right. He said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, yes, Peter, but don't tell anybody. Wow, can you imagine what an upset that would be? Of course, I'm sure Peter went out and told a lot of people because Peter was Peter, a lot like me. Anyway, these Bible verses we're going to talk about this Sunday, both prophetic prophecy and actual event, will encourage you, I hope, to inspire you to live with, live with Jesus as the king of your life. Many of us will be celebrating, actually all of us will be celebrating Palm Sunday at home this year due to the coronavirus quarantine that swept our nation and our globe. Let's look at what actually happened on Palm Sunday and study it a little bit more in depth, maybe talking about things that you never heard of or knew that God designed in this message. Why is Palm Sunday so important? What does it mean? Why was Palm Sunday the only day that Jesus allowed himself to be declared and worshiped as king? In fact, he literally said, if these people didn't cry out, these very stones would cry out. That's pretty potent. What's behind that? Why did he hold the Jews accountable to know this day? What happened as a result of them not recognizing this day? Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem, as in Luke 19, 44 through, excuse me, 41 through 44? What punishment was placed upon the Jews? Let's start with this day, Palm Sunday. In the beginning, we're going to study it from the prophet Daniel, because he foretold the coming of the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, 200 years before Christ himself was even born. Daniel was a, one of the many prophets. His name means, God is my judge. He lived from 620 BC to 538 BC. He's, he was sent to Babylon in 605 BC, so he's about 15 years old when he was sent with all the Jews to Babylon as part of their punishment. He lived for about 80 years, 
Now remember, prophecy is the ability to tell the future, not guess it. Who can do that? Who has the power to tell the future? Only God is omniscient, knows everything past, present, and future. He alone, he designed the world. He designed everything, including time. And he is not by, bound by anything that he designed. So he can step in and out of the timelines. He knows everything. In fact, he knew everything from before he created the world itself. That is pretty amazing. What I'd like to do is to dwell on this prophecy that Daniel had about the coming Messiah. And just to be sure, many people have said, oh, the Bible can't be true. They must have known that beforehand because it happened exactly as it has, and no one's that good. Well, they're right. No one is that good except one, God. Well, how does he know? The answer is in the question itself. He knows what happens. He knows everything. He knows the very hairs on your head, or the lack thereof in the case of my brother. Anyway, to fully appreciate the remarkable significance of the book of Daniel, it's essential to find out that Daniel was translated from Hebrew into Greek, along with the entire Old Testament, about 270 BC, again, almost three centuries before Christ was born. It's a well-established fact of secular history. The Septuagint was formed, a bunch of Greek Jewish scholars that went back and translated the Jewish writings into Greek writings. And at the request of Alexander the Great, who promoted the Greek language throughout the known world, and thus everyone, Jews, Gentiles alike, spoke Greek. Hebrew fell into disuse and became kind of for ceremonial use, much like Latin and the Roman Catholicism. In order to make Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, available to the average Jewish reader, a project was undertaken by the sponsorship of Ptolemy II Philadelphus, 285 BC to 246 BC, to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. 70 scholars were commissioned to complete this work, and the result is known as the Septuagint. The book of Daniel is actually one of the most authenticated books of the Old Testament, historically and archaeologically. archaeologically. But this is a covenant shortcut for our purposes here. It's critical to realize the book of Daniel existed documented form almost three centuries before Christ was born. But Daniel, originally deported as a teenager, now the, near the end of the Babylonian captivity, was reading the book of Jeremiah. He understood that the 70 years of servitude were almost over, and he began to pray for his people. The angel Gabriel interrupted Daniel's prayer and gave him a four-verse prophecy that is unquestionably, I believe, the most remarkable passage in the entire Bible. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Let's look at these four little verses. They come into the four as, start the four as 9, 24, the scope of the entire prophecy, that is telling the future. 9, 25, these mysterious 69 weeks. 9, 26, an interval between the 69th week and the 70th week, 927, the final 70th week. 70 weeks, let's read Daniel 924. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, hasn't happened yet, and to make an end of sins, hasn't happened yet, and to make reconciliation for inequity and to bring an everlasting righteousness, hasn't happened yet, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. Nope, hasn't happened. The idiom of a week of years was common in Israel, a Sabbath for the land in which the land was allowed to follow, lie fallow every seventh year. It was their failure to obey these laws that led to God sending them into captivity under the Babylonians. Note that the focus of this passage is upon thy people and thy holy city, that is, upon Israel and Jerusalem, it's not directed at the church. The scope of this prophecy includes a broad list of things which clearly have yet to be completed. The first 60 and 90 weeks, Daniel 25. A very spe specific prediction occurs in verse 25. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem into the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. This indicates a mathematical prophecy. The Jewish and Babylonian cal calendars used 360 day years, 69 weeks of 360 day years totals 173,880 days. In effect, Gabriel told Daniel that the interval between the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem until the presentation of the Messiah as king would be 173,880 days. The Messiah, the prince, in the King's James translation is actually Messiah Mashiach Megid, the Messiah, the king. Megid is first used of King Saul. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes Longimonus on March 14th, 445 BC, as found, guess where, in Ezra, chapter 7, verses 11 through 28. Right there in their own scriptures, there was the answer. Emphasis on the verse street and the wall was to avoid confusion with the other earlier mandates continuing to rebuild the temple. During the ministry of Jesus Christ, there were several occasions which the people attempted to promote him as king, but he carefully avoided it. Mine hour has not yet come. The triumphant entry. Then one day he meticulously arranged it. On this particular day, he rode in the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, deliberately fulfilling a prophecy by Zechariah that the Messiah would present himself in just that way. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, the king cometh unto thee, and just that, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9 9. Whenever we might easily miss the significance of what significance of what's going on, the Pharisees always come to our rescue. They felt that the overzealous crowd was blasphemy, proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, the King, which he was. However, Jesus endorsed it. I tell you that if these should hold their place, the stones would immediately cry out. And it was a beautiful thing when I get a chance to go over to Israel and you go to the Mount of Olives and you're going to find the area has been pretty well picked clean of stones. But I still was able to throw a couple in my pocket and just think, I tried to look and find them for this message to show you the singing stones, but I couldn't find them. I couldn't find them. So maybe a future message will do that. <clears throat> On that day, Jesus presented himself as king. And that day occurred on April 6, 32 AD, Palm Sunday, 32 AD. When we examine the period between March 14, 445 BC and April 6, 32 AD, and correct for leap years, we discover that it is, get ready, 173,880 days exactly to the very day that Daniel foretold Jesus would arrive and present himself as Messiah the King. How could Daniel have known this in advance? How could anyone have contrived this detailed prediction documented over three centuries in advance? But there's more. There appears to be a gap between the 69th week, verse 25, and the, 20, and the 70th week, verse 27. And after three score and two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and that sanctuary, and the end, therefore, shall be with a flood. And into the end of the war, desolations are determined. Daniel 9, 26. These 62 weeks of years follow the initial seven. So verse 26 details with events after the 69th week, but not before the 70th. These events include the Messiah being killed and the city and sanctuary being destroyed. As Jesus approached the city on the donkey, he also 
predicted the, the destruction of Jerusalem. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about <clears throat> thee and compass thee around and keep thee on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Luke 19, 43 through 44. So you see, Jesus held the Jews accountable for knowing the time of his visitation, but they didn't. Was it because they had gotten too many traditions that clouded up their exact looking at the Bible? We know through 2,000 years of history that the Bible is God's word. We have the blessing now to go back and see what's happened and see these things that have come to pass. Israel being reformed. So many unbelievable, miraculous things that have pointed to the truth of what God's words were. But the Jews missed it. As we know, they denied that Jesus was the Messiah. Some got it, but very, very few did. In fact, they got to the point where they chose Barabbas instead of Jesus. And for this, the Jews were held accountable. The Messiah was, of course, executed at the crucifixion, but it says in the scripture, not for himself. He was crucified for us and for our sins. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed 38 years later when the Romans under Titus Vespasian began a siege and leveled the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD precisely as Daniel and Jesus had predicted. In fact, as one carefully examines Jesus' specific words, it appears that he held them accountable to know this astonishing prophecy of Daniel 9, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Pretty sad. There is a remaining 70th week period to be fulfilled. This period is the most documented period of the entire Bible. The book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19, is essentially a detailing of that climatic period. The interview between the 69th and 70th week continues, but it's increasingly apparent that it may be over soon. The more one is familiar with the numerous climactic themes of end times prophecy, the more it seems that Daniel's 70th week is on our horizon. Have you done your homework? Are you and your family prepared? I'd like to offer a prayer if you will bow your hearts with me and, uh, and let's pray to our Heavenly Father. Oh, our Heavenly Father, we give you such honor, such glory. You are such a miraculous person, entity. You, we can't even wrap our minds around you. We can't even wrap our minds around the little things that you've done. And what a, what a miraculous book you've put, an owner's manual for us. And if you are a loving God, that's what is just so amazing. And as I said in my first sermon, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we live in such a period, the period of grace, the period where all one has to do is to accept you, to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that you raised him from the dead. And that's it. We'll be saved. Please, Lord. For any of those listening to this message that they have not accepted that gift, lay it upon their heart to accept that free gift that will change forever their eternal salvation, their eternal destination, Lord. I pray that for all my friends and all those listening to this message. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Well, we've covered over, over a lot of things here in this, uh, in this message about the prophecy of Daniel being fulfilled to the very day. But let's take a little bit more look at what happened on Palm Sunday and why it should be important to us. Well, it's exactly like God said, Jesus did come in and he did allow himself to be declared as king and the Messiah. He admitted that he was that. And it was for that reason that he was put to death so sadly. Think of that. The Jews were his chosen people, and he went back and made sure that they had the scriptures, the very scriptures, the very scriptures told the day that he was to visit, and they missed it. But you know what happened? We happened. How is that? Well, you see, before 
during the law, the Gentiles had nothing. We didn't have the law. We had no chance. We had nothing. We were doomed. But when Jesus came, he brought and fulfilled all the parts of the law. And he brought about a new covenant. The new covenant is called grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Freely given. And this won't last forever, but it is a period of time now from Christ's death to at least 2020 and beyond, at which time all you have to do is ask for it and you will receive it. It's incredible. I mean, I've thought a lot about it. And if I could have, which I don't, the chance to be born at any time throughout the whole creation of the earth, I used to think, well, I'd love to be alive during Jesus' day and really get to meet him. Well, and then as I became a more mature Christian, I realized I will meet him. But what if I was born back then and I didn't get it? What if I was born back then and my parents didn't pray for me, my brothers didn't pray for me, and I didn't get it and I was lost? Wouldn't I rather be born today and have 2,000 years of history proclaiming that the Bible is true, that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us and all we have to do is accept it? This, my friends, is the one exception to the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. This one is too good to be true, but trust me, trust God, trust the Bible. It definitely is. And I would ask you, if you haven't considered accepting Christ, and it's just that simple, it's just believing. It's saying that he is Lord and God raised him from the dead. It says you'll be saved. That's it. Please think about that. Please, during this time of crisis, please, during this time of, of despair and discouragement, please, hope is on the table. I don't think it's a coincidence that God allowed this coronavirus to spread over and during the Holy Week, the week when he presents himself as a solution, not to just the American people, but to every person on the planet. 